you've probably all heard of the normal distribution and you can't get away in statistics without having heard about the normal distribution. If you're um, a teacher, you might have been asked, why aren't your marks distributed normally? That happens in exam boards up and down the country. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the normal distribution, but first of all about approximating in general um, and also things that aren't normal. The times when you get normal distributions, the times you don't. Um, and I said, for those who, I'm sure you've seen the sort of pictures, I said there's bell-based pictures of the normal distribution. So is it really as normal? Um, the normal distribution comes up partly through approximations. Now, you, you don't just approximate the normal distribution, you might approximate to all sorts of things. But what we've got here is a picture of the binomial distribution, is the histogram underneath. And that's um, about coin tossing again. So much is about coin tossing, just reaching for a coin. So what's, what's happened here is if you toss a coin six times, you get a certain likelihood you'll get none, you'll get a certain likelihood you'll get six heads, and things in, in the middle. Um, so you might get three, three heads, three tails. Now, if you actually toss it, you'll get a, an empirical distribution. You can toss it and toss it, measure it up, build up your distribution, and uh, you'll get the numbers in each. If you did that thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, you'll get closer and closer to the, the theoretical binomial distribution, which works out that exact probability. So if you toss a coin, just one coin, it's 50-50. So it's 50% likely to be a head, no, or one head, 50% likely to be no heads. If you toss it twice, um, you've got a 25% probability of being two heads, no tails. You've got a 50% probability of it being a head and a tail in one or to the other. And then a 25% uh, probability of being two tails. If you look at, again, just go for the counts of heads now. For three, your probabilities are one in eight of all heads. Um, uh, three, I have to do it, three eighths, I think it is. I think, well, that three eighths, I've got it wrong. Yeah, three eighths have been two to one, three eighths have been one to two, and one eighth have been, get it right eventually. I won't try and do it for four or five. But here's the numbers being plotted for six. You can see that histogram for six. Um, and what's important on top of that is a normal distribution with the same spread factor and the same average point, which is three. And it's not, it, although it's it's pretty crude, it's you can see it started to approximate it. If you have a thousand head um, coin tosses, that looks so close you wouldn't even notice. Actually, 10 or 20, you'd hardly tell the difference. So, um, now, interesting here, we're approximating a discrete distribution with a continuous one. And you, you get that quite a lot. It seems a bit weird, but you see that quite a lot. And in fact, in computing, we often um, approximate continuous things with, with discrete things. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do arithmetic on a computer. Um, so we move back and forth. One of the, I said, you can approximate with different distributions. You, you know, sometimes you have some phenomena, it's happening in the world, and you say, well, it's close enough to that. Sometimes not precisely, but it's, it's approximately like that distribution. Um, the normal happens a lot, though. You get the normal distribution happening on, you know, not with small numbers, but like large numbers of coin tosses, you know, but also heights of people. How do coin tosses, when you uh, toss hundreds of coins, and the heights of people and the exam marks you get, why should those all have the same general shape? It seems a bit weird. Now, in fact, um, oh, sorry, this is just pointing out the, some of these things. Oh, that's the other thing. I, I forgot to mention that. That's right. The normal distribution is unbounded. Um, so here you're approximating a bounded discrete distribution with a continuous unbounded one. So in reality, you can't have negative coin tosses, but uh, for the purposes of cer certain things, you can approximate it almost as if you could. OK, so why is the normal distribu distribution normal? So um, I sort of want to say it's because of the central limit theorem. It's not. The central li limit theorem is a bit of mathematics, doesn't make anything happen. But the, the, the central limit theorem is the, uh, the bit of mathematics that works out why it is that natural phenomena actually follow the normal distribution. Basically, if you take lots and lots of things and average them together, and it doesn't have to be an absolute average, it doesn't have to be an absolute adding together, but a sort of near adding together, um, 
and they're around the same sort of size as each other. So if you add one huge things to lots of little things, that doesn't work. They've got to be around the same size of each other. Um, that's because if you add one big thing, it takes over and it, whatever distribution it has is, is important. So you can see why they need to be the same size. So if you add lots of things, approximately adding them together, there are around the same sort of size. There's nothing or no group that dominates completely. They're nearly independent, but actually it doesn't matter if they're not totally independent. If if one thing, you know, like if the if the, the coin tossing experiment, remember the biasing things when we do um, the uh, uh, online experimenter with this, if you bias it, imagine you change it. So if the first one's ahead, then everything's likely to be ahead, not just the next one, but everything forever after then that means that you sort of pull things, that first coin toss takes everything over. So you can't have something taking over completely, but you can, you know, you can have a little bit of, of non-independence there. Songs are nearly independent. And they have finite variance, which if you've heard of the word, you'll, you'll sort of understand it, but then finite variance, what the heck does that mean? Then you get a normal distribution. So, so you can sort of see these things. If you think about heights, what's happening there is you have a lot of your genes can affect your growth. So it's not just one gene that affects it, not like eye colour. It's lots of genes affect your growth in different ways. Lots of environmental effects, effects you know, um, influence your growth. Um, things that happened when you were in your womb, things that happened as a baby, things that are happening as you grow up. So you've got lots and lots of different effects. Um, Mostly there's not one thing that dominates. If there's some catastrophic illness when, when you're little, that might dominate. But for most people, lots and lots of effects, they're sort of not quite adding up. It's not a linear summing them all up, but near enough they're adding together. And same sort of things of comparable, lots of, lots of small effects of comparable size, sort of independent from each other. You get normal distributions in the population for height. I've, I've circled that finite variance. The reason for that is occasionally that doesn't happen. Um, mostly, mostly it's okay for most of the data you do for a lot of things, a lot of biological processes, a lot of processes we'll see in user interfaces. Um, this is all good for. Um, so what can go wrong? Nonlinearity can get in the way. Um, if you have something like a threshold effect, so that if things hit some barrier, they either can't get bigger um, or they something strange happens, they behave differently. So that would cause our absolute maximum. So you might have lots and lots of effects that add up, but if there's some threshold that stops them getting bigger than that, or if there's some threshold that makes them jump up, then you'll get something that's non-normal at the end. Um, so that's that happens. One of the things that can cause nonlinearity, as well as, well as thresholds, is feedback effects. Um, so something like a snowflake is a positive feedback effect. If, if ice starts to form in a little peak, then more ice is likely to form on the same peak. So what happens is they get longer and longer and longer, and you get the sort of thin ends. And then you know the little something that causes it to branch, then the branches get longer. Um, so that tends to cause spiky structures, um, which have a non-linear characteristic. And clouds are the opposite. They're a negative feedback effect, so they end up being a bit more clumpy. Um, bimodal exam marks may well be to do with this. So if you're doing something like mathematics, where one of the problems with maths, if you start to not be able to understand things, you can't understand the next thing, you can't understand the next thing, that's a positive feedback effect. It's one thing influences the rest and it goes on and gets worse and worse and worse. So it's no wonder that you sometimes then get that splitting that you get one group that's doing really, really well and the other that's failing. Um, and that can happen within the class as well as through, throughout somebody's education. So positive and negative feedback effects can, can influence this. But we'll come back to this unbounded variance thing I was mentioning on the last slide. Um, Variance is just that, is this mathematical measure of the variability of a distribution. So it's the sum of the squares of the difference from the average or the mean. All right, um, so you can, won't go into that great detail, but it's, it's a measure of that variability. Normally, if I take a sample, I, well, it's tossing a coin or take 10 people from society and measure how high they are, 
I can work out what the, their variance is or their standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance. Um, so for heights, I think your normal standard deviation is a couple of inches, perhaps three inches, plus or minus, I can't remember, for heights in society. Um, if I take my sample of 10, I might get, sometimes I might get a variation of two inches, sometimes four inches, but over time it will average out, it'll come out. You know, I do lots and lots of those, or have lots of people and measure the variability, not just their average height, but the variability of the height. That will eventually get closer and closer to whatever the variability in society as a whole is. That's what happens with heights. It happens with a lot of things. But there are some phenomena where if you keep on taking samples and you record the variability you get over time, instead of the average getting closer and closer to a value, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and unbounded. So it's not infinite, but it's unbounded. This used to be sort of, to be honest, when I first started doing stats, these were quite rare things to see. Um, one of the one of the examples actually is wage and wealth distribution. So you saw that very long tail on the income distribution. Um, the number of things in that tail can be big enough to mean there is no finite, sensible thing to talk about variation of the distribution as a whole. If you chop it off at a thousand, look at the bit there, you can talk about a variation there. But these stretching, those few huge values just make the very, it may mean it's sort of unreasonable to talk about variation. What happens is when you do samples, some of them come out at first, at, you know, the first blob, which is the most of the population. And every so often, one of your samples will have one of these huge ones in. And um, the variation you get is enormous. The average probably will, be, will get pulled up, but in particular, the, the variation for that sample becomes enormous. So I so said they used to be relatively rare to see within a HCI sort of setting, and I mean, in stats in general, to be honest. However, increasingly, people are aware of what's called power laws. You might again hear this term. So power laws are sometimes people talk about scale-free distributions. And there's a number of natural phenomena which have this property. So like earthquakes, you can get small earthquakes, little tiny tremors, and you get bigger earthquakes, and you can get even bigger earthquakes. Um, and there is a, the, you can look at the distribution of the size of earthquakes. Um, and what happens is, there, it's a bit like the income distribution. There aren't many really powerful earthquakes, but there are a few, and boy, when they happen, are they big. So they pull that distribution out. Um, sandpars do the same, evidently. You know, if you experiment with sandpars and pour sand, or perhaps think about um, an hourglass, and watch when the sand, a little bit breaks off the side and falls off. So it piles up and it piles up and piles up and it breaks away. It piles up and piles up, a bit breaks away. The size of those breaks, like the size of the earthquakes, you get sometimes just one or two, two sand things. Sometimes you get this cascade and huge bit all falls away. And again, very tail heavy. The tail of the distribution. So this is the thing, a small number of things, you know, ones and twos of sand piles, small earthquakes, small of of things happen very frequently, but there's this long tail of things that happen very infrequently, but are also quite um, quite big. Um, crucially, networks, things like Facebook connections, network phenomena, social network phenomena, are long tail distributions. They are power law distributions. A uh, number of links from a web page. Most web pages, one or two links, or perhaps a few more than that, a few web pages, thousands of links. If you look at incoming links, most web pages have very few things pointing to them. A few of them have thousands and thousands of things pointing to them. Um, friends on Facebook have said most people have two or three, or probably again more than that, perhaps 20, 30, 40 friends, few people, thousands and thousands. Um, this distribution has unbounded variants. You cannot approximate them with a normal distribution. So all the stats you do with normal distributions, if you throw in network data, and there are manipulations you can do to try and start and different ways of doing it. But if you don't know that and throw network style data in, you get complete rubbish and you'll get some, um, could easily make some very, very bad inferences based on that. So power law data is not normal. Even if you average it together, if you get thousands of people social network together, average out their number of friends, that will never ever end up being normally distributed. You can't use your t-tests, you can't use your ANOVA without doing some manipulations. You've got to do something differently.